Uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Just literally, please stand, Dan. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I didn't put pens out. Does everybody have a pen? It would take me two minutes to get back and get one. Okay. Well, good evening and welcome to the Board of Trustees for the School Town Speedway meeting for August 14th, 2018. We are working from a 17 item agenda. The first item is to approve the minutes of the July 10th, 2018 meeting. Mr. President, I move that we approve the minutes from the meeting of July 10th. Thank, thank you, Bill. Laura? I second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the minutes of the meeting for July 10th, 2018. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Okay. Let me use a pen real quickly. It's super purple. John, tonight, can you just hand these right on down to Nancy? Do. And she can take documents with her. Thanks. It's weird. Item number two is to conduct the public hearing on the 2019 capital projects plan. Mr. President, I recommend you open the hearing and accept comments from the public. <laughs> Curtis, thank you. Thank you. Then I'd recommend thank you close you. the hearing. <laughs> Item number three, adopt the 2019 capital projects plan. Dr. Trebley, do you have a recommendation? I recommend the 2019 capital project plan be adopted. Uh, Mr. President, I move that we accept the Dr. Trebley's recommendation to adopt the capital projects plan. I'll second. Thank you, Debbie. It's been moved and seconded. All those in uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Pass this 5 0. Item number four, renew property damage and professional liability insurance coverage. Um, our, our property damage and liability insurance carrier, which is Liberty Mutual, whom you see on television regularly, and our agent, Carter Matthews, through what was commonly called City Securities, is now called NSF Insurance Agencies, uh, has brought to us a quote for next year's property damage and liability insurance and workers' compensation. Uh, this current year, the total premium was $142,282. Next year's proposed premium is $146,575. It's uh, about a 3% increase. If you look at where the increases that make up that difference, uh, the biggest one is in property. Well, we added build space and square footage at Wheeler Elementary School, and we need to insure it. Uh, you can see our general liability is up minimally. Same with Inland Marine, which is really computer insurance. We do carry a crime policy in case our data is ever breached. Uh, terrorism policy is simply included. Automobile insurance is up slightly. We did add a pretty big food van this year. Workman's compensation is up $800, which quite frankly surprised me. We've, we've had injuries, but we always work diligently to get people back to work. And the umbrella policy for liability is is increased but anything you see this is simply 
frankly, when the agent calls us, they say things like, we haven't seen renewals this good. It's, and it's because we have a very good claims history. We do have people get injured, we get them back to work. We don't make claims on our property insurance if we know that it's something within our means. We try to be good stewards and keep our liability at a minimum. So I'd recommend you accept this quote for continued coverage for property, or property and casualty insurance. I'll make a motion, Mr. President, to renew the property damage and professional liability um, insurance coverage. I'll second. Tom? It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item number five, the 2018-2019 enrollment update. Mr. Disney, what's enrollment like? Um, I gave you a spreadsheet today of today's updated enrollment. Um, the total enrollment with specific elementary school size, class sizes of today. Um, it's important to notice that this writing about 73 percent or 38 or 53 of our elementary classes have less than 20 students and the largest class in school corporation has 24 students enrolled. That means the average class size mean at the elementary level is slightly above 18 students and the average class size at the secondary level 7 through 12 um, is 21 students. Um, and the total load of a secondary um, teacher is about 126 students. Those kind of numbers are outstanding. Um, our overall enrollment is down um, where it was at this point last year, um, but we have teachers in, in place in case it starts to increase. Our total enrollment at this point is, as of today, is 1,779 students. Mr. Disney, corresponding date last year, the time of our September or August board meeting last year. Any idea where we were? Yes, this is the ninth day of school and on the ninth day of school last year we had 1,839 students um, at this time last year so approximately 40, about 60 students less than we were at this time last year. Well that's wonderful for class size, it's not very pleasant for budget. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm completely comfortable we can afford these class sizes, okay? We may not raise our cash balance and may drop it a little bit, but I want you to take, first off, we will not need to add any teachers late. We've had other than one class that we divided after two days of school, every student has been with their teacher. Every student's had a desk, every student's had, we are off to a start and within an hour we were, we were learning. Uh, last year, I would tell you I took responsibility for keeping class sizes too large. We should have divided some classes last year sooner. We should have seen the growth coming. And that was an error I wasn't going to make for a second year. Good news is I think with these class sizes, we can, we'll see, I, I think we'll see our achievement be level this year, but not see the usual jump for last year when we, I think this year, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see some real benefit out of this academically for our students. We'll see our teachers be able to go more in depth and do things at the elementary and at the secondary level. Junior high school is down about 15 students and that doesn't sound like much but a student in every class. Uh, high school has grown but we've had the staffing. We are completely and adequately staffed. Um, I, I just, the numbers are great for learning. They're expensive but we can make adjustments next year if need be, although I'd hazard to say you probably haven't had many contacts about class size in your school activities other than it's good. So, uh, and frankly, there's not much we can do about it right now. We've got the teachers, we might as well put them to work and have good things. So, so uh, and I'm optimistic that while we likely will not grow to the 1,855 we had last year, I do think we'll grow by another 30 to 40 students. And every student helps. Mr. Hall, if I could add, the uh, board asked us to, to look at the number of students that, that were um, screened for early entrance into kindergarten. And we had five students total that were asked to be screened, and one student was determined to be ready 
for, for kindergarten. Um, so that was goes about a, the same amount as we said at that meeting earlier this summer. We have about the same amount every year, about the same amount of our qualified as ready for kindergarten. So since kindergarten students early entry wouldn't count on this list and wouldn't be counted and would bring us dollars, early entrance didn't hurt us or help us. It really wasn't much of a factor, except it was right for that student, and that's a good thing. For that student, it was very important. Thank you for being willing to let those students who were ready come. What, um, I understand that at Newby, you know, the old workroom got converted, so we have classroom space. Does that cause us to think any differently about, uh, you know, school addition? Does that the kind of same, does that make that more of an issue or does it not really change anything? Makes it more of an issue, quite frankly. Uh, I would, I would say to you that we need to start this fall to look at the potential for adding at least two, uh, no, two classrooms, we'll be right, and another restroom to that building. If we can get started on that, pro here, here's the good news. If we can put that process in place and come to that conclusion, we can conceivably put this together and have ground broken next summer. And so we might have to only go one more year in these conditions. Um, with, with the workroom, I mean, we, we're using every usable space. That's just all there is to it. Um, and timeline-wise, being prudent, doing this, we can, we can put this plan together through the spring of next year. Uh, the good news is we don't have to go through a remonstrance, a referendum. The cost of that addition would be, would be within the ground. All we need is the town council to support us, and I don't think we're going to have a problem with that, <laughs> given the situation. Um, but that you've just you've just kind of gave me the nice lead into that's coming. Would we not do the portables at all? Would that be, I mean so you know with Wheeler we did that kind of made sure then went to what would make we, us jump right to building? I, for me and and that is that that's a, a good question. Newbie doesn't lend itself, and, and this this is purely a one thing, and it, it can always be overcome we put plumbing in the portables at Wheeler. A little more difficult to do given the location at Newby, but doable, but doable. Um, the, the, for us, setting up for the portable is an $80,000 proposition. Mm -hmm. Putting the portable on site is another 40,000 the first year. It's about $120,000. Then the second year it goes down to $20,000 expense. You've, you know, you're simply leasing it. Um, my, my answer to that is, is it, we definitely could do that. We might have to amend our capital projects plan or spend a little bit of our rainy day fund. Definitely doable to see if, my second part though is foreseeably, this is not a two year thing. And you know, we kept, we kept portable classrooms at Wheeler for four years because we were told that things were gonna change and they never did. We would have never put those there for four years. I don't think anybody would have. Um, the second thing is, my personal opinion is the building needs a second set of restrooms. It's living on one anyway. <coughs> and so, I mean, to some degree, they, they build their daily schedule around when they can take their kids to the restroom. That's not the best <laughs> educational reason. And it was much easier when they had 167 students. Yeah. Right? So, so could we? Yes. And I think that would be a good deliberative discussion to look at cost, time, and where it is. Um, the president and I had this, uh, here's one, another good thing I can say about that. If we would go with portables and not need them, we don't have the million plus dollar expense. That's a good thing. Uh, but if we do go there and we put in two classrooms, when is the last time we put classrooms on a building that we didn't need them anyway for something? Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, we've moved special needs children in, into a different smaller space. It's appropriate for the number of students they have. We do not have a computer lab. We do not have a art music room or a music room or a share of that. We have no teacher work room. I'm not sure we can reasonably put more than two rooms there, but we'll fill it quickly. Mm -hmm. so, so, but it's a good question and it shows thought about not doing something very quickly. And I've never been accused of doing things too fast, obviously with Wheeler, because we did that we let that go too long.
Thank you. Great. Thank you for the enrollment update. Uh, item number six, present drafts of school calendars for the 2019, 2020, 2021, and 21, 22 school years. Dr. Trebley has worked on this. What, what's the history of it and what do you have for us? In your packet, 2019, 20, 20, 21, 21, 22 school year, we met with, uh, we've worked on this for about a year and uh, we brought it to the association, Teachers Association, the last couple of months. They've had copies of this. Uh, we follow the rules and guidelines that we kind of put in, in place. No kids in June and July. That's kind of the, the number one rule we had, and we squeeze in 183 days in the other months. So at the end of the day, you can play with fall break, Thanksgiving break, Christmas break, spring break, and depending who you talk to, depending who you talk to and when they take their vacations is when they kind of want the vacations to take place. And after months of this with the Teachers Association, they've come to a conclusion what you've done in the past is working for majority or if for the teachers association for their liking of it meets everything in the middle there's never going to be a day we keep everybody happy but what we have in place is something that has been working and it gets 183 days in in june and july kids are not here what makes um, a question that i have what makes the timing of spring break so christmas break obvious uh, fall break it seems like it fits that week and I'm, I'm sure that has something that seems pretty consistent but like for instance on the 1920 calendar that's a you know that's a later spring break than it has been sometimes so what makes what is, it doesn't go with Easter so what does it do I know the answer to this one okay now for starters the the timing of spring break was done as a gentleman's <coughs> superintendent's agreement in Marion County. And the rule was spring break week included April 1st. So if April 1st was on a Sunday, it would, it would begin actually on March 30th. April 1st was on Sunday of that week, and it would continue through the first week of April. If April 1st happened to be a Saturday, spring break would start as early as March 23rd and continue. And that, and now what's Marion County at one time, most of the people who lived here, most of the people that worked here either had children in one school system, worked in another, that was a consistent agreement. Then the move <coughs> to year round calendars happened and two weeks spring breaks started to happen. And then the rule, the unwritten rule, because it wasn't a rule, there's no law, was that one of the two weeks, if you're doing a two-week break, would include April 1st, okay? And that has completely disintegrated, okay? <laughs> there is no guideline, <clears throat> rule, or consistency. It started when one of our, our school corporations to the north just said, we're not doing that anymore. And now I can all, I mean, I'm old. I worked in Hamilton County. The rule in Hamilton County was spring break occurred in the first full week following the 1st of April. So if April 1 was on a Saturday, break started on Sunday the 2nd. <coughs> but if April 1st was on a Sunday, the break didn't start until Monday, April 9th, the first full week after. And one of our corporations on the north said, we have more connections to Hamilton County than we do to Marion County. We're going to go with a break that fits them. Mm -hmm. And that's what they chose. And since then, it is, it is whatever. And, and being the old traditionalist superintendent and knowing that spring break moves, but I don't think you can find a spring break that didn't include April 1, somewhere between mm -hmm. Saturday and Sunday. So that, that's the only reason, and it could change, and it makes whatever you change it to will make some people happy and some people sad. I guarantee that. And I, I want to make some other points. If you would be inclined, and we're not asking you to adopt these this evening, we're asking you to look at them, think about them. 
Um, if you want to go out and have your own little survey of your neighbors, you go ahead when you find the one that makes everybody happy. Because the one everybody wants is to start after Labor Day, have have a fall vacation, have a Thanksgiving vacation, have two weeks surrounded by travel days at Christmas time. They want to have every federal holiday off, including Columbus Day, Veterans Day, and Flag Day, even though that's in June. And they want, no matter what, they want it to end before the race. And if you can get 183 days in, you just make that calendar and you will be loved. Not going to happen, but that's so. The best thing I found, and I and I know that Miss Gonzalez is looking at me because she's heard me say this multiple times. The best calendar you can have is the one that goes as far into the future as possible, so that people can plan around it. Because we don't have next year's calendar, and we are getting questions about that already. And. Now, the, so the good news is the sooner you adopt, sooner people will, and I don't mean sooner like we got to do this tonight, but the earlier you adopt this, people will adjust. The other good news is, is this could go in the trash. Because if the state of Indiana makes a law that says no school shall begin school any earlier than the last Monday in August, you don't get to say local control, we get to keep our calendar. You get to say thank you and go on to whatever they say. So the bottom line is you're adopting three years with the hopes you might get through all three years. You would be eventually. So, I, uh, so the, all I can tell you is the history. Mm -hmm. When spring break is can change. It can, we don't have to, like I said, I, we don't have to have travel days. Although people, you know, for me, as you all know, the one day that's sacred is carburation day. I would prefer to do anything than say we're going to school on carburation day because I tried to do that about four years ago and thought that I was, whether you fired me or not, the mob was going to run me out of town. So that's my only fear is carburation day. So I'll say one really positive comment I've heard from parents about the spring break and having the Friday before and the Monday after. Mm -hmm. It's allowed folks who either don't have the means or the vacation time or both to be able to still have some sort of small trip, small time away with the kids on one of those vacations. So that's a really appreciated addition over the years. Mm -hmm. What's the board's pleasure? Well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not making a recommendation, but if you're inclined, first off, you could adopt this evening, and if you change your mind next month, you can unadopt. I have a question. On the third, on 21-22, what happened to graduation? We just not know yet. You know, we don't. We try not to set graduation until we get so closer get to it because okay. of weather. I wondered about that. I'll also. I'll, I I'll, what went, you know how I got messed up on graduation this year. So that's why I'm asking. <laughs> See? So, well, Friday and Thursday. So when, like this coming graduation is going to be on a Friday, and then the next year it's on a Thursday. Is that what I'm looking at? Or do I look at that? Graduation's not on here, so I don't know when it's going to be. Mm -hmm. now, May 29th. May 29th. Well, that's a mistake. Okay. Because we do, the high school sets that later than now. Okay. okay, we'll get that off before we publish so it. So I don't. Okay. You don't want to. <laughs> I will tell you what I do like. Did, did y'all like commencement this year? Was that quiet thirty-one minutes tolerable for you? Make no mistake. A reason it's like that is because it happens after the race. All of the celebration and the hooting and the hollering when we do graduation. I've been here now, 15 of these dudes. When we do graduation on the Thursday before the race, we have a, a ruckus crowd. And when we go after the race into that following week, when we have plenty of time to make sure every kid's grades are right, life gets simpler and better. Now, it's up to you on, on what kind of commencement you want to have, but we're going to have some commencements before the race, but if it were up to me, we'd always wait until the week after, weeknight, when everybody's got a whole lot more calm in their system. And to be clear, we're just waiting on the graduation dates because we want to see how many snow days. If yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. In fact, I, I'd take them off. That wouldn't have been on my calendar. Because as soon as you publish that, it becomes the day of no return I got my announcements Grammy's coming from North Dakota Ta -da -ta -da. and then if that kid who's graduating doesn't have 180 days then they're gonna have their commencement and they're gonna come back to school unless you'd like to give up one day's funding what I'm 
hearing though is that the teacher association has said this works for us yes i i guess i mean we could have it this not fly but to me that's i mean there are definitely things that i think ooh, i hate that <laughs> you know that ugh. but Again, you know, I can't, I, and I, I actually spent some fairly significant time trying to come up with alternatives and where if I added that day back in to this Christmas break that seems nuts to me, where I would get that day from, you know, type of thing. And I, I couldn't do it. And so I think if it's, I think that, um, and someone else probably did it about the spring, you know, whatever, exactly as we've said. So to me, the key is if the teachers association has kind of signed off, then far be it from, and, I, and I've tried to come up with maybe a, something I could float out there, couldn't do it, then I move that we, write, we, we adopt the calendars. Well, I have questions. Because I don't think going to just a Friday, like the 2nd of August, just, I can, I can see that being a problem for folks. Um, you know, I my, put my kid in school for one day. <clears throat> so, you know, some part of me says, why wouldn't you just go on August the 1st and give up January 3rd and go back on the 6th? And so you added a day at the beginning of August. Because then your teachers. a day in January. Your teachers have to go back on the 31st and they yeah. don't want to. I hear that they don't want to. I, just, I, 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 I actually think there's a different teacher perspective on this. I cannot agree with that except what teachers have told me over many years is the last thing they want to do is start with a full week right they like a partial week sure. and if they can kind of have that orientation day on that friday yeah get the books out get everybody used to it that's a day worth doing it but that that could just be that's who that what that person wants to do those are sample sizes of three and sure one. but but i you know I, I think that come up with a better idea and see if it flies and make everybody happy because I'm going to tell you I don't think I'll get the five of you happy but if you can you make the one you want and they'll adjust to it well you know here's the disadvantage I build a calendar for somebody else right right and I don't worry about whether I make them happy or not that, that's right <laughs> this one makes the right so equally makes everybody unhappy so right and that's and that's what I do at work it's the you know it's it is governed by when holidays fall and such but um, it just I, I don't know it just seems odd to me to go to school for one day I do understand the partial week. I also understand the, um, the, the attractiveness of the partial week. Um, so th that's why I was trying to figure out if there was a way to um, go on the 1st and 2nd of August, but then not go on the 3rd of January and just start back on the 6th of January, um, whether that trade would be possible. But again, it, it is what it is, and nothing will ever make everybody happy. Guys are just gonna have to struggle with it. What do you want to do? Well, there's a motion on the table. Anybody have an interest? If if not, we can move it forward if you'd like. Well, I see three options. You can either get a second and vote, or you can say not get a second and it'll hold, and then we'll bring it back next month. I'll second the motion. Been moved and seconded. Any additional discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Motion passes for. No, it actually an abstention goes with the goes majority. Goes with the majority. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. So. And, and here's here's the good news. I I I, I a, that whole idea of starting a week with a day. I'm actually more concerned about the one day coming back in January. Oh, yeah. That's why I was but trying that'll to. Be, as opposed to the one day at the start of the year. But it's one year. Sure. We'll see what yeah. next year brings. Oh, yeah. And what attendance brings. And the thing I think, because I thought about that, and as I'm looking at that, I'm thinking that still pulls the teachers back on Friday, and it gives them a first full week. And I'll bet you most teachers would say, I'm coming back on Friday, I'll come back on Thursday, and I'd love to get the kids in the classroom, get them going, and then we come back for our first full week. So it doesn't surprise me that teachers, at least some teachers, you know, thought that that was, I would say there's, I would guess there's enough of them that would prefer to do that than have a first full week that... There, 
there's another option for you at some point because remember we're not talking about this Christmas this is 17 months away mm -hmm, 16 mm -hmm, months mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. yeah you have one other time during my tenure decided to have an 182 day student year and you've given the teachers a day and for all I know it's going to be snowing and icy that day anyway mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're, you understand what I'm saying mm -hmm. so you have the option of of essentially making Christmas break two full weeks there it, it, it's not one that's impossible and it's not something that couldn't be done if you're so inclined okay it, it really is, is not impossible you have lots of options but the good news is since you've moved and voted for this we'll get it out on the website we'll get it out and we'll let people who knows we may have more pushback on it than we've ever had it'll be first but it, we may it's just that getting the teachers back to the day early thing that's the killer. It's, it's, I couldn't come up with anything. Item number seven, uh, present the 2019 school budget. That will be Kyle and Nancy over on the big screen. Are you ready? <laughs> I got moved. As you're aware, January 1st, 2019, all things will change for the school finance as the legislation has decided that we are going to move away from certain funds that you've been used to for the last forever, to my understanding, to the new world, which is again January 1st, 2019. 1973. What's that? 1973, 1973 is when those funds forever. Um, so, some key points to this. Number one, we're going to eliminate the school general fund that you're used to. You need me to have a mic. This will fire up here in just a second. Uh, number one, we're going to eliminate the school general fund. We are going to create an education fund to be used as, as an exclusive fund to pay expenses allocated to student instruction and learning. This, we will also create an operating fund. So the bottom line here is there's going to be two major funds that if you'll turn to page one in your white binder that says School Town of Speedway 19 budget, August 14th, we will start with the first new fund that what you're going to see is a lot of the general fund will be moved over into what we call the education fund now. And if I touch this screen, I know this will be hard to see, but at least we'll have a pretty picture here as we go through is exactly what's in your binder. So the first fund that we have is the education fund, very similar as if in the past years that you'll see what we're paying out of this is the cash balance. What's in this fund is actually the cash balance of 12% and the second line is where I want to bring your attention to the state support and the state support is the tuition that we get at we're budgeting for $13 million. 82%, 82% is people, it's your teachers, it's your substitutes, it's salaries, benefits, it's supplies, that's the big part of the whole budget is the second line item which is the state tuition. We use that number from the ADM which is the enrollment of how many kids do we have, how much money do we get from the state and that's where we project where we're going to be at 2019, $13 million. Again, that's 82% of the budget, and as you go down to the lined items, that's in the education fund. We have the summer school, interest, cell towers and rent, ECA, reimbursements, education license plates, and I'm going to stop there for a second. If you're on the lined item 11, lined item 12 is something different, and that's something that over 20 different workshops, 20 plus, that Mr. Hull, Ms. Johnson, myself have been to, these are the big conversation pieces. How are we going to move certain things from such as a capital project plan, which is now called the capital asset plan, how are we moving some of these things from the referendum fund into the education fund? This is something, guys, that's about this thick in a binder that she stay, she's in her office most days, and Mr. Hull and myself, trying to figure out how does this all work. And that's the point where I want to get to, because this is an important piece. This is a transfer line from the referendum to the education fund. We have two major funds. I would quiz you, but I know you already know this. Education, operation. For example, this line item that says we're moving money from the referendum, separate fund, into the education fund because it says by state law, coaches, athletic directors, and whatnot 
cannot stay in the referendum any longer. It has to be moved over into the education fund. And that's one example of this. The number that's next to this on number 12 lined item, $519,000, if we're going to move the expenses over to it, we have to have the appropriations and the money to pay for it. So that's what's going to be a little different as you see as we move forward. How do we balance this out? At the end of the day, 100% from the education fund or from the revenue, 100% of the appropriation, guess what we get 100% from that. So that's the education fund. The appropriations is what we have um, as we go through. And again, that's from remediation. That's your teachers. It's what we pay people is the big percentage of that. Can I stop you, Kyle? Yes, you I'm waiting. You also have $150,000 just labeled as transfers. Those are educational above in your revenue on the top, second, mm -hmm. last line. You also have expenses that in the past were in capital projects for technology, software, and the people who support that software. Those previously were paid from capital projects. Now they have to be paid from education. So. The transfer of spending comes in, and it's down below, so the money has to follow it. So if, if, you, if the term shell game begins to happen, we're bringing $150,000 from what formerly was operation, or formerly capital projects operations back in to get that total number. So he's, he's gone through the revenue, now he's going to tell you how we're going to spend it. <laughs> With regular instruction, again, that's teacher salaries, special education instruction, summer enrichment remediation special program tuition student support instructional support school administration eca and community service and transfers from the operations fund on the back page and i'm going to show you this my yellow tab flip over four pages and you're going to see some descriptions of each uh, line item on what we pay um, for those areas again it looks like this that kind of helps once you have a visual of that there you go yep so we went ahead and broken it out to different things that we do pay from that fund and that's just a sample of those the transfers from the operations fund um, 2.9 millions again is the same thing like I said shell game it's moving the correct appropriations to the correct fund The second page, if you'll flip over from the education fund, is the referendum fund. And that's something we've been used, that we're used to, and that we already have. The revenue from that is from property tax. And we'll get to the percentages on the last slide. Uh, excise tax, commercial vehicle, and FIT, which is financial institute tax. Those are all revenue, how we gain, how we, um, uh, how we have the revenue that comes into the referendum, and where do we spend it? Well. That's on the, the second chart, which is newbie teachers, the regular instruction, special education teachers, behavioral specialists. As we go down the list, um, district administration, school administration, all the way down to line 22. So, well, I have security services, student transportation, and then 22, again, I want to point that out, is the transfer uh, to the education fund and 18 other expenses. On that back page again, you'll see examples of each line item, what we spend that for or where that money goes to. As you can see, regular instruction from the referendum, 33%. We, we get the referendum, we're paying it. 33% of that goes to teachers and student support, such as aids, um, other uh, services that we do for the students. On the balance, $4.3 million, you see the balance from the revenue in, appropriations on what we have for that, equals out 100% for that. The rate of this is 5228, is the, is the referendum rate for 19 that we suggest. Nancy, anything else? No. Okay. Education fund and operations, those are the two big ones. Referendum was the second we talked about, but we jumped ahead to the operations. And this is 
This is interesting for me because I had the capital projects, and that's what I've known my whole career in education. This year, we're not allowed to say, well, we're, not, we're allowed to, but I'm not going to call it capital projects any longer. It's going to be called the capital asset plan, and that's what we've uh, uh, voted on earlier on today. So this is the, a total separate, or for the capital asset plan, is built into the operations fund that we're used to having separate funds. It's all collided in one. So quick recap, what we used to know as capital asset, just get used to, I'm going to get used to calling it, it's in the operation fund. And within that fund, that's where we manage and maintain our facilities and maintenance, anything operationals, uh, such as the superintendent. He's on the operations side, not the education side. He's the, the, giggling. The point is, the superintendent <laughs> is not, does not contribute to education. <laughs> he contributes to the operation of the district. Hmm. But we see that, again, property revenue is important to know that how do we get the money. It's, a, it's a property tax, excise again, comp, the FIT, technology grants, and then we again have line item 9 and 10 of transfers, and then we had a cash balance of 81000 So the appropriations for that, you can see the maintenance uh, all the way down. I know you guys can read through this. Property tax cap, district administration, the maintenance, property liability insurance, operating physical plant, Special education, transportation, professional services, construction improvements, copy leases, equipment, transfers to the education fund, emergency fund. So that, those are your two, the two big funds. The emer is, again, the operations and education fund. The last three, the last two, this is one of my favorite ones, the debt fund. So we have the two big and we have the little ones. Again, we have to raise, help me, Mr. Hull, 0. 000 7. $0.00007 for our debt fund to pay off $4,048, which is? We actually had $18,000 of unpaid textbooks, but since, if you remember the project where we put in the new windows in the high school mm -hmm. we never spent the extra money we just transferred it to debt as a as a surplus and we've been using it to pay so our rate is is going up from zero to seven one hundredths of a penny well that, well that doesn't sound like much but when you don't we could have spent that money on other things the year we did the construction we just put it in debt and it lowered taxes but uh, it will be gone this year right we will spend it out <laughs> And the last one's rainy day fund, go technology, which is a cash balance of $178,000. Uh, there's appropriations for contracted service. This is where the autistic specialist comes in, special ed services, the behavioral specialist, their salary, and that's where we, that's where we pay them from, um, from this account, the rainy day. We pay whatever we might not have budgeted in the general fund. We're not going to spend $100,000 of rainy day fund. It's a protection. This is a safety net. So the last page is the tax rate fund. That's predicted and actual. This is my favorite page, though. You get to the 19, what's going to be advertised. And then the 19, column B, predicted. And as you can see, the annual increase and decrease at the bottom, point, or seven, uh, 0.07. The actual predicted 2019 is 0.02 for the increase for that after everything said and done. An, an interesting part of this page is I've kept an average of what the rate has been across all the way to the far right outside the table. <clears throat> In a referendum, the average over the years has been 50 cents. This year we're recommending 52. It's a little bit high because we're trying to protect ourselves from unknowns in a budget change. The average of operations, we've never had operations before, so it's, it's itself uh, what it is. The average of debt has been $0.03. Cents. We've been low in the last few years. Our average total tax rate is the lowest in Marion County, $0.8743 cents per $100 of, of assessed property. We're advertising it as $0.91. Cents. It's going to come in at 86 It's going to. It's a two cent increase. And it's still below the average of the last one, two, three, four, five, six years. We are stable. The only time our tax rate goes up 
is when we add new rooms to a school and we have to incur a million dollars worth of debt for two years. Some other things that, that I just want to point out that, that are important uh, on the referendum page, I'd like to tell you what the real cost of the referendum is to, to the homeowner. It's the bottom table. About a quarter of our homes are valued at $94,000 or less. That costs that person $152 a year, $13 a month. Our highest quartile of homes are about $145,000 average, many, many now higher. That Values are going up. Uh, that costs the homeowner $328 a year, $27 a month. So even when we add in that referendum, we still have the lowest total tax rates in Marion County for education and not even comparable to the suburbs, all much higher. So we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, I'd like to also go to the operations appropriation. The very top line is property tax cap. That's an appropriation. What they're saying is that the people in some cases will hit the property tax cap of 1% of their home or 2% of their, their apartment rental or 3% of their business. That's high. It won't be that much. It'll be $78,000. That's the state's estimate. They have never been right and they have never been low. But we work with policy analytics and Bill Sheldrake inside Marion County and they predict $78,000 and they've always been right, not high or low. But when you go in to do these forms, they won't even let you change the number. <laughs> it is a, the state says. So the reality is we're not gonna lose 111,000, we're only gonna lose 78, and that's gonna be another $33,000 that we're not gonna spend, I guess is what you'd say that. Um, these are things that frustrate me. When you've been doing a local budget for years and years and years and you can show them the data, doesn't matter. Increasingly what the budget becomes is we're going to tell you what the numbers are, you figure out a way to work inside of them. So consequently, any help from the state makes me run. Just be that candid. I want to be on the record. We're better at this than they are for our school district. When we're done, we're going to have about the same amount of money in the bank, eight to nine million dollars at the end of 2020 that we're going to have at the end of 2019. The biggest thing that will stop that from happening is low enrollment this year, which will reduce the 13 million dollar state. And again, I'm going to say we have a transfer built in from, we have, we actually keep a separate fund called self-insurance, which is our way of insuring for a year like this. I'll also tell you that the treasurer and I have gotten two pieces of good news today. One is that we now have invested $4 million with Trust Indiana and we're getting 2% interest on that. So this $60,000 in interest, if this holds up, will look more like 80,000, but we'll estimate. Well, I'll come back to my final statement on any budget. Uh, and we've run payrolls for next year, for this coming school year versus last school year for the most expensive thing, the teachers. And our payroll, because of retiring out people, is actually going down this year. That doesn't happen much with us. So my fear of losing the money from decreased enrollment, and I'm always going to worry more than I hope, is not going to be as bad as I say. And I don't know, I think we came to that conclusion about 6.45 this evening. <laughs> it's been a rough day. But, but thank you, Treasurer, for giving me good news right at the end of the day, and let's hope it continues. Uh, make no mistake, Kyle and Nancy have done a great job on this. They've understood one rule more than any other. Oh, I'll also tell you our health insurance is going down at cost, no doubt in my mind. Um, Always estimate your revenue low. Always estimate your expenses high. And consequently, you will have a balanced budget. They have come to me at three different times and said, no, no, no. Estimate revenue lower. Estimate appropriations higher. <laughs> and, and I think we're in pretty good shape for something that I've had less to do with than I typically do. 
Now, uh, first of all, entertain any questions on details or you're talking about a guy who forgot his budget book back in his office and Luke's been loaning me his. <laughs> I'd just say I appreciate everybody's attention to detail on this and I know how important this is because nobody in the room panicked with item number five when we questioned enrollment thinking we'd have to do awful things because we know that the budget is um, in good shape and I think that's allows us to keep the class sizes that our community asks for so I appreciate that. This has been hard for me for the last four years because I'm not making a recommendation to you as a board to adopt this budget because you don't adopt a budget anymore. All I'm asking you to do and I'm asking the president to look down the line because I'm looking for your consensus that I present this budget to the town council next week. I've slated to do that at 6 p.m. On, on Wednesday at their finance committee, August 15th. No, August 22nd. I'm a week behind because this meeting is so late. But, uh, but, Mr. President, if you see consensus for presenting this budget, I'll do my best to convince the town council to adopt it. Just move forward with that. Thank you. Nancy and Kyle, thank you. They did a great job. It was quite, quite hurtful to me when they took some of my, this works a little, looks a little bit about like my work, and then after one day they came back and said we made it better. Item number eight, approve resolution authorizing the superintendent to reduce the 2018 budget appropriation across all funds as necessary to fund the 2019 budget. The way we fund this budget is by not spending money this year. We have done this resolution, it's a routine every year. We're asking for you to give us permission to spend less money. I'd recommend you do so for the rest of 2018. <laughs> I move that we approve the resolution authorizing the superintendent to reduce the 2018 budget appropriations across all funds as necessary to fund the 2019 budget. Thank you, Laura. What she said. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> all right. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? This takes the signatures on two copies, and when it gets to the end bill, if you'd hand it back to Tom, then he'll sign a second time, attesting that you are all who you say you are. And then, Tom, I'm going to ask you at this point if you would hand these, the two completed copies, well, the treasurer will come to you to get them, because she's going to exit the meeting and get these on file immediately, because gate, the gateway is always open. Item number nine, approve the discontinuation of health insurance agent services. It's my recommend. Nearly eight years ago, we started using Aon Agency and specifically an agent. Uh, at, at this point, uh, I, I'm recommending we discontinue our agreement with Aon for insurance agent services for health and employee benefits, long term disability, life insurance. Uh, and I'm recommending we discontinue that service with them and if if you're so inclined I'm going to recommend that we replace them with a local agency called LHD. Laura? I move that we approve the discontinuation of the health insurance agent services. I'll second that. Bill? Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? 
All those in favor? Opposed? The motion passes 5-0. Item number 10, designate equipment as surplus for disposal. And I'm going to ask Dr. Trebley to talk to you a little bit about this. He's worked on this, but I do want to make sure that you understand the threshold of materiality is $5,000. And technically, you as a board, you don't have to approve this list. This comes from the fact that before that threshold was established, I always asked every board to approve everything that we're going to discard because I want it to be clear that some of these things are, and when we say discard, we don't believe there's enough money. We've had auction agents come in and look at what we've had and say, you'll pay more for the auction than you'll get for these things. So what we do is if you are inclined to, to call these things surplus, we'll then make them available to local charities. If they, but they've got to come pay, it can't cost us a dime. Except for the technology, there's a certain issue with that. But I'll let Kyle talk about that. Yes, <laughs> well, that is so true. Um, so all these items here in surplus are in the high school and the junior high uh, basement. We went through it all. Most of these are nicked up to to the point of they they're, they're not going to be able to go back out into the the, the classrooms or whatnot. Some of the uh, equipments on the surplus list, page one and two, are are still things we've been hanging on from the. Uh, um, fax rooms so most of those kind of have rust on at that time so a lot of these things are going to go to the goodwill it's going to go to lord's kitchen and lord's pantry and places like that if they so choose if not we're going to just like mr hull said uh, destroy the computer and the chips and the memory so that's the plan but but he's, he's he's been anything that has memory in it our agreement is it will we, we if we have to pay we'll pay somebody to put a drill and destroy anything so that and certify that it's been destroyed we hope that we can find a company that will do that work in exchange for harvesting the small amounts of silver and metal in there but if we can't find somebody to do it for free we'll pay them a contract and service because we never want to have a speedway computer get out there with student data on it that someone found at the local garage sale so my recommendation is that you approve this list for disposal and we will take care of it I'll make a motion to approve the um, equipment as surplus for disposal Does thank you David. I'll second thank you Tom it's been moved and seconded that we designate equipment as surplus for disposal any discussion all those in favor opposed this is five zero Item number 11, approve food service employees 2019-2020 wages and salaries. The last time we did this was two years ago, and two years ago we did it for a two-year period, and this crept up on me, so I apologize. It really should have been done last month, so what I'm going to ask you to consider doing is approving the new salary and wages retroactive to the start of the school year. So that, uh, pleased, I, I remain pleased. Uh, we have very well-paid food service people, and they, they earn it and they deserve it so I make that recommendation with enthusiasm that you set the new wages and salaries wages in this case all hourly wages I'll move that we approve the food services employees 2019 2020 wages and salaries retroactive to the beginning of school thank you Laura a second thank you it's been moved and seconded that we approve the food service employees 2019 2020 wages and salaries retroactive to the start of the school year all those in favor? Vote. Motion passes 5 0. Item number 12 ex approve extended contracts. And each year, this, this is uh, relatively routine. There are people who work beyond the school year, and we're recommending that, they, that their contracts they be approved for this employment uh, at their daily rate for Joe Smith, the high school or junior high guidance counselor, five days. Kevin Burke, a stipend for his additional work in the evening, helping with student transportation. Uh, Joe Troyer, the media specialist at the high school, five days. Uh, guidance counselors Chuck Bennett and Misty Davenport, five days. And this year, the innovations class, we're recommending that uh, it be co-taught by Sarah Ackerman and Ryan Dunphy. Uh, everything about this is routine and fits within what we've done past years. I move that we approve the extended contracts as specified. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you, David. It's been moved that we approve the extended contracts as specified. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion passes 5 0. 
Item num number 13, the acknowledgement of grants received. If you, by, I'm hoping by consensus, you'll accept $73,687.58 in grants. Gladly, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Item number 14, resignations. Mr. Disney, what's up in personnel? The recommendation is to accept the resignations of Alyssa Coleman, who is the elementary physical education teacher, Stephanie Pageant, Allison Home School Advisor, and Brett Lane, Captain Manager at the to approve the resignations of uh, Brett Lane and also of Stephanie Pageant and uh, Alyssa Coleman. I'll second that. Thank you, Bill. Been moved and seconded that we accept the resignations as presented. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Item number 15 employment recommendations. Before I turn this over to Mr. Disney, I want to ask the board to consider a change in, in practice. And it's, it's a pretty simple one, but if you remember, one of the things we talked about in our audit of services, we talked about having one person in charge of personnel, and we have done that with John Disney handling resignations and personnel for consistency. Tonight we have an extensive, what I'm going to call, personnel report. And it somewhat becomes almost cumbersome and redundant when Mr. Disney reads all of the names and positions, and then whoever makes the motion reads all of the names and promotions, and then the president reads all of the names, and, and it becomes almost like a, a... What I'd like to suggest is that these be read once by Mr. Disney when he makes the recommendation and calls this a personnel report, and then from that point forward, absent your desire to take one of these out, we simply move approval of the personnel report and eventually so that we're not reading these. Is that, is that reasonable to try this? Yeah. And if it works, maybe we'll go forward. Yeah. Mr. Disney, do well. We had some leaving. We have now have some coming. The recommendation <laughs> is to employ Mr. Edward J. Sheck as elementary teacher, Ms. Calissa Guy as elementary teacher, Mr. Brian Hunneman as custodian, Ms. Michelle Mulligan as a cafeteria worker, and Ms. Don Newman as a homeschool advisor. I'd also like to recommend the appoint the following people to extracurricular positions. David Todd, who is a high school academic competition assistant coach. Cindy Franklin Toon, high school key club sponsor. Brian Dunphy, high school assistant robotics coach. Lori Duran, high school special projects. Jasmine Johnson, High School Special Projects. Elizabeth Denny and Allison McKay, High School spe Special Project that will be split. Eric Rosegrove, seventh grade assistant football coach, junior high school. Dan Maple, junior high equipment manager. Jessica Tawney, high school choreographer, and since she's a new employee, there's a packet included in your materials. And also to recommend the approved of following volunteer coaches, and their application is included. Caitlin Long, high school volleyball, and Joseph Davis, high school girls soccer. Let me interject. We, we call some of these things special projects because that's how they're officially labeled in the master contract. The association and the, and the administration has agreed that the, what that is for can change given year so we're so John what are these what what are the special projects that Lori Duran's doing Jasmine Johnson Elizabeth Denny and Allison McKay Lori Duran's special project is, is she chairs I step and PLC meetings and <coughs> curriculum so they align to I step um, in the math um, Jasmine Johnson does the same thing with language arts um, Elizabeth Denny um, is a new teacher mentor, um, and Allison McKay is a community outreach coordinator with her ESL um, duties and population. Understand a full stipend for this is twelve hundred dollars, and a half stipend is six hundred. So that's what they're actually doing for the, what we pay. 
I'll Tom. move that we accept the employment recommendation report as presented. Thank you, Tom. I'll second. Thank you, Debbie. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the personnel report as presented. All those in favor? Opposed? Passed as 5 0. Item number 16 recognition of visitors and other business. Hello, thank you for being here. <laughs> Item number 17 approved claims. We, we do need to go. I just you also have uh, information about the Indiana School Board Association Fall Conference. You, so. and, if, and, if, and we have tentatively registered everyone. If that's not going to work, then we absolutely will, will pull that registration. Um, another thing to be thinking about, we have a volunteer. Uh, the board president has agreed to fulfill one of our, what I would call one of your board responsibilities. And if no one else is interested in the Indiana or the National School Board's convention, he'll go so we get the credit. By the way, he, he's not wearing his new cap point lapel pin that he <laughs> earned, so we're a little disappointed in that today. But other than that, I don't have anything additional. We're good at the cause. Let's pay some bills. Uh, pay some bills. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President, for reconvening the meeting because without this, I would have had to have a meeting. We're not to adjourned. So. <laughs> okay. Technically. We have conducted all of the business that we typically would conduct in a second August meeting because the capital projects plan is adopted and the insurance quote is accepted. It would be my recommendation, and that, that is the, those are the sole, well, and to perhaps look at additional teaching personnel, which let me tell you is not going to happen given the budget as it is, but uh, at least I can't bring that recommendation in good faith, but our class sizes are. So my recommendation would be is that you cancel the August 28th meeting. Here, here. Is that a motion? <laughs> Mr. President, I move that we cancel the August 28th meeting. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded that we cancel the second August meeting. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you.